Legends in music. The multicolored and bright, unique step arises before one's sight, and there you can hear the exciting sounds of a dumbra. The dumbra always has different sounds. They can be lyrical and temperamental, powerful and heartfelt. It tells about the boundless Kazakh steppes, about the life of nomads and their thoughts, the aspirations of the steppe people. In the slow or upbeat melody, one can catch both the rustle of grasses with the sound of streams and the jubilation of bird choirs with the neighing of horses. The kui is not just a complicated melody with a peculiar musical sound, but it also told a story which has a deeper meaning, told through the language of music. Since ancient times, Kuishis have told many stories behind these works, but over time, musicians have only switched to perform music. And if we could find out what the Dumbra is singing about and what story is embedded in the Kui, our imagination would be enriched with greater meaning. So what exactly did the author of the Kuishi want to tell us? Now one can only guess. You have to collect the crumbs of history that have been preserved by the people's memory. Various versions of the legend are preserved in this or that Kui. Sometimes these stories are very different, and sometimes they are very similar or intertwined. We will be able to tell you about one of the expositions of this musical work. Perhaps we will become much closer to this music, to the unique creativity, which is so characteristic of the depth of thoughts feelings, and the perfection of musical accompaniment. On the shore, which sharply and abruptly broke off to the river, sat a young man, fixing his sad look before him. He was dressed poorly, but very neatly, and his direct bearing and expressive facial features were full of energy and intelligence. Despite his youth, his thoughts were serious and deep. Very often he came here on this beach and played a beautiful melody on his beloved Dumbra, but he himself thought about the injustice of life in the village. People like him work from morning to late at night, and they cannot even eat enough and not only hunger is the eternal companion of their life, but the oppression and greed of rich people. He watched as the river flowed majestically and freely, and he wanted at least for a moment to feel this unexplored sense of freedom. Suddenly he heard someone shouting out his name. The jigit stopped playing and saw Tao Zhan running to him, his peer and friend. Yerken, Yerken, shouted the guy. Boranbai told everyone to come to his yurt and to make felt carpets. They cut off wool from all of his sheep. There's a ton of wool just laying there. Hot blood hit Yerkin's head. He frowned his eyebrows and said abruptly, I'm not going, and I'm not his sheep. I'm not at his disposal. Come on, Yerkin, let's go. Evil people will report that you were not there, and the Bai will not forgive you for this. Stop it. If you're afraid for your whole life, you'll never be a worthy man. I said I will not go, the young man said. If born and by gets angry, then, then, I don't care, Yirkin interrupted his friend. He has power, but who are you? I'm a free Jigit, here I am, the young man said angrily, and turning around, he walked away. Tao Zhan looked after his friend and breathed heavily. He clearly understood that grief would lie on Yirken's shoulders. Such is not the nature of the Bai that he would forgive any self-will. When Yirken returned to the village and saw what had happened, an acute pain pierced his chest. His father lay on the ground, beaten almost to death. He rushed to him. 
Tao Zhan sat beside him and wiping his tears with a dusty hand said, Burun Bai ordered his servants to beat your father because you disobeyed him. Father, forgive me, if I'd known, his son squealed. Tears streamed from Yirkin's eyes. He pressed his father to his chest, clutching his fists and convulsed from grief. His father lost his last health, a farmhander who worked his entire life to the insatiable Bai family. And now, with a whip, they knocked the last strength out of his thin, emaciated body. This is all because of me. My son, his father could hardly move his lips. Do not grieve so much for me. My term was already very close. The Bai has only brought it closer. I will never forgive him for that. For you, I will take revenge. I will do it for you and for all of us, Yirken groaned. No, don't do it. God himself will be our judge. Yirken bit his lips to the blood. Fury and anger filled him. Make me happy. Play my favorite kui. What? Yirken did not understand his father's request. What did you say, father? To play you a kui? Yirken whispered and looked at his friend in bewilderment. Taojan jumped up and ran after the Dumbra. Returning, he handed it to Yirkin. With this melody, I will relive again all of your wonderful moments. Grabbing the air, the father said heavily, I will remember how I met and loved your mother, the beautiful Aisulu. I remember her tender voice and the day you were born, my son. The hands did not obey Yirkin. He could hardly hold the Dumbra. From the vain strained strings, tears trickled down and dropped to the ground. The strings trembled and sang a beautiful melody. The father listened and his heart filled with joy for the last in his life. For many years, Kaisar hadn't been to these places, as he went to study blacksmithing. He forgot the intoxicating smell of the steppe grasses and the singing of the birds. He walked along the familiar native valley, and he remembered everything here, every hummock, every hill. From early morning until late at night, Kaisar learned to forge. He used to chop the hot iron skillfully and easily, like soft wax, and he became the best pupil of the master. He had a good fame, and he lived well. But longing for the house completely exhausted his heart. He decided to visit his family. He walked and remembered the hot, dry hands of his grandmother, who were hugging him, the affectionate songs of his mother and the sincere conversations of his father. Here was his house and here remains his childhood and his youth. But suddenly, his face grew gray. He remembered the insufferable Bai, Sir Ali. His fat, swollen body was disgusting, and his greedy soul was blacker than a thundercloud. Kaisar shook his head. Now he became a glorious master, and now he will come to his Aul with his head high, and if only the Bai tried to show his displeasure. Now he can stand up for himself and for his loved ones. Descending from the hill, he saw the girl walking and quickened his pace. And when he came up to her, he spoke, a low bow to your father, that he gave birth to such a beauty. 
the girl smiled and kindly answered the unknown Jigit, Thank you, and an easy road to you, traveler. I grew up in the village, which can be seen in the distance, said Kaisar, and he pointed with his hand. I haven't visited these places for a long time. I remember only that life was very hard here. Really? The girl raised her eyebrows in surprise and said, I do not know, Jigit. You surely have not seen our place for a long time. We live in prosperity, and there are no disadvantages among us. You say so because you are very young and you have strength. But what about our mothers who are bending their backs for the insatiable buy? And everything is not enough for him. We weave carpets and sew bedspreads, and the house itself has no scrap of material. The girl looked at Kaisar with surprise and shook her head. I do not know what you're saying, Jigit, but our bai is generous. When shearing the hair from his sheep, you can take as much as you want. There is so much felt in the village that the yurts are lined with carpets, not only inside but also outside. Farewell, Jigit. I need to take a turn to go to the river. Kaisar's eyes were rounded with the girl's praise of the bai. He decided that apparently she must be a relative to the bai, and that's why she lived without knowing any grief. He looked at the blossoming valley and on the green hills, so light and well was in his soul. The elderly man went out to the road. Kaisar bowed to the old man and greeted him, saying, Many years to you, Aksakal. And you, be strong in body and spirit, my son. Do you need any help? Kaisar asked. No, no, don't pay attention to the fact that I'm old. My body is like a tree. It's dry but strong. I'll rest a bit and then go on. I need to get to the next Aul by the evening. But where are you going? I'm going home. Look in the village that I see below. I haven't been there for a long time. I studied blacksmith craft. It is commendable. We need blacksmiths. Without you, we can't fix horseshoes or repair the rim. No, I will not stay here. I do not want to bend my back for the greedy buy. Although it is hard to be far from home, I will not be his farm laborer. Why do you say so? Our buy is not so greedy. He will share the last cake with a shepherd. No, you will never find such a generous buy as ours in the whole district. May God grant him a happy life and many children. Kaisar looked in the face of the old man and thought. Apparently his age did not spare his mind, and he was completely insane. Kaisar did not answer him, and saying goodbye went on. But he passed very little when he saw a dusty cloud rushing straight at him. He heard the trampling of hooves and examined the clubs of dust and the stout, strong stallion, driven by a dashing jigit. Seeing the stranger with curiosity, the horseman stopped abruptly and, bowing, cried aloud, Glory to your family, jigit, and prosperity and goodness of God. Where are you going, wanderer? To the village, which is only a stone's throw away. I was born here, and now I'm returning home. I'm Sabaz, son of Ghani. And you, whose son are you? The Jigit asked amiably. My name is Kaisar. My father is Jusip. He used to be a famous one for his power in the heroic things. Sabaz smiled and exclaimed joyfully. Why, he was famous, and he's still strong even now, despite his advanced age. He is strong. Only mockery is tolerated by the father for the arrogant and envious Bai. My heart is pierced with pain. Our Bai respects all inhabitants and treats your father with great respect. Yes, what are you saying? It's like I don't know, Kaisar exclaimed in anger. Apparently you have your own truth, Sabaz replied sadly, and whipping his horse, he rushed along the road. He looked in confusion at the Jigit. Kaisar could not understand why everyone was praising the Bai Ser Ali so much. 
Probably it was because he was frightening the people so much that everyone was afraid to say even the words of truth. He frowned farther. Heavy thoughts prevailed over him. Finally, Kaisar reached his aul and saw the first yurt, and then another, and then a third. All were covered with white felt. The yurts of rich families, these are understandable, so he went on. Not far off, he saw several men. They were discussing something vigorously, waving their hands. Kaisar walked imperceptibly to them and listened. One tall man with a courageous, serious face spoke thoughtfully and in a businesslike manner. He says good words, Kaisar thought to himself. He thinks smart about everyone. Kaisar listened to him, but then everyone noticed him. He was for them a stranger, and very few people could recognize him. Where are you from, Jigit? one man said. Kaisar told about himself and added that he had returned to these regions to see his parents. He is afraid that the damned Bai had brought them, probably to poverty and to half-death. The men exchanged glances, and one of them said, You are not fair, Jigit. Our Bai is honest and fair. We live here in great prosperity. Ha ha! Kaisar laughed spitefully. I would like to see this honest man. Who will take the milk away even from a new mother? Look, here I am, said a tall and courageous man whom he had just listened to attentively. How? In surprise, Kaisar replied, I was talking about another by, about Sir Ali. Yes, you are talking about my father. Not every son is like his parents. I also suffered from it, and swore from the time I was little that when I would grow up, I would be a completely different person. Kaisar then understood everything, and bowed low to him and said, If it is so, then I will stay in my native village. And Kaisar embraced his parents finally, for he was home again. The famous Kuishi Baijigit made an outstanding contribution to the development of instrumental music and the flourishing of the Kui Shirpe. He lived in the times of the Khan Abilai. Baijigit, according to folk traditions, composed about 300 Kuis, for which he was nicknamed the Demon of Kuis. <laughs> 